It's because they've moved on to uh, other jobs or other places of service. Our guest preacher this morning uh, is one of those who moved to another place of service, Brother Jacob Harthcock. And uh, I remember the first time I met Brother Jacob, he was a little, he was, I don't think you were ever a little kid. <laughs> you were still a, a head taller than everybody else your age. You were a younger kid in, in vacation Bible school. I remember that first Bible school. I met him and uh, New Harmony was the host that year and we had a big time that year. And, and I, I don't think I would have ever picked out then how the Lord has used him, but the Lord called him to ministry and, and uh, called him to proclaim the life-changing message of Jesus Christ, and he's doing so now, and uh, married, and the Lord is just blessing him, and we're so proud for the, the small part that the Lord let us have in his life, and we're so glad to welcome him back on this homecoming to bring God's word to us. So, Brother Jacob, you come and you preach as the Lord leads. Good morning. Man, it feels like a long time since I've stood right here. Man, but I guarantee you, it's going to be a little bit longer than two minutes. <laughs> but I would just like to thank Star, not Star Baptist Church, New Bethel, Star Baptist, where I'm at now, for all the prayers and the encouragement. Like, like Brother Kurt said, the first exposure I had to New Bethel was Vacation Bible School. It was the Amazon Outfitters, and he nicknamed, nicknamed me Tricker then. But now I know why he nicknamed me. I'm a trickster, but I won't steal anybody's birthright. But for those who do not know me, I'm Jacob. I'm the student pastor at Star Baptist Church in Star, Mississippi, on 49 South of Florence. I've been there for two years, and I've been married to my lovely wife of nine months, Michael Hodcock, where I met at college where I graduated last December. Uh, I've been really busy since the last time I was here. But one of the things that I've learned about being a student pastor is is it's really good to be repetitive. Students forget. I'm not a student anymore, and I still forget. But every Wednesday night, I'm saying, all right, get your Bible. And grab your Bible. Everybody grab your Bible. Grab your Lord. Say, this is my Bible. Get out It's my Bible. It's God's holy word. It's a lamp to my feet. A light in my path. God's sword of the Spirit, which is sharper than a two edged sword, that cuts straight to the marrow of man. It's profitable for teaching, rebuking, and correcting. It is a love letter written to me. And I do that every Wednesday night. Because the repetition helps them to learn and see what the Bible is a tool that's God's gift to us. So, in your Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. I've been extremely blessed to be where God has placed me now. Thank you, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Please stand. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you once were far off and been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and citizens and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, 
Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. May God bless the reading and now the teaching of his word. You may be seated. Ephesians is by far one of my favorite sections of passage in the Bible, favorite books. This was written by Paul to the church in Ephesus where he spent a lot of time in. It is the place where he spent the most time out of all the places he planted church in. And it's one of the few letters where he's not singling out uh, problems going on in the church. He's writing as an encouragement, as a reminder, kind of guiding them on forward. But he's writing, and right before this passage of Scripture is one of the most beautiful, simplest presentations of the gospel. And in verse 11, it says, therefore. Now, a little bit of English grammar. Whenever it says, therefore, it means it's pointing back to what was just said. So you've got to go back and read verses 1 through 10, talking about the gospel, about how we were once lost, and God did a mighty work on the cross to save us by his grace and his love. There's nothing that we as individuals can do or work through to get to achieve on our own, but through His grace and His mercy, that He has gifted us to it to us through faith. Absolutely beautiful passage of Scripture talking about the gospel. And He says, therefore remember. And it's kind of like that, that double, He's like, all right, go back and read, but also remember. See, I've been thinking a lot about, about memories and and growing up here and growing up here in this community. And it's just, it's been amazing to, to be able to experience the love of this church. And memories do great and mighty things. And, and Paul is telling the readers in the church of Ephesus and us, therefore remember you Gentiles. Because he's saying, remember that moment in the past when you were physically separate from Israel the circumcision. You were physically not a part of them. There was that that strained relationship between you and the Jews of Israel. Remember that. Remember the the part where you were not a part of the, the covenant celebration or the promises of the Old Testament. Remember that. Because he's he's trying to do a couple of things, I think. And and memories do several things for us. Memories remembering causes action or inaction. We've all had memories to cause us to go do something or cause us to not go do something. I remember, I was thinking way back, I mean, this was like when I was six and I think Caitlin was three when we lived in Richland. And it was late one evening, Mama was in the kitchen cooking, and there was a, I guess it was a pot of boiling water. I don't, I don't know what was in it, what was happening. I'm standing back. Mom and Daddy are out on the back patio, and Caitlin is in there, and, and she sees, I don't know why, but she sees that pot and says, that looks like something I should grab. So she walks up to it and grabs it, and the whole pot of boiling water just pours over. We won't go to the emergency room and everything, but she's not grabbed a boiling pot of water into the front, and I haven't either because I saw her do it. And that that is a memory that I took and that she took and I'm willing to think that some of us here have done that before, that we've not done that again because it was painful, it was hurtful, and we didn't want to experience that again. A positive memory that I learned from that I do now, there was a time where I lived over here and hunted over here and I, I get a phone call while I'm hunting and it's Aaron and he's stuck over there really close by to where I was hunting. He's like, hey, I need you to come get me unstuck. I was like, Aaron, I'm sorry, but I'm hunting. He's like, man, are you, are you, are you for real? Are you not, you're not going to come out of the woods and come help me? I was like, no, I'm hunting. I'm busy. I can't do it. And he has not let me live that down. But now, if someone needs help, drop what I'm doing to go because I feel bad about not helping Aaron out. So all my friends thank Aaron now because I'm real helpful. But memories also help us to understand, to gain wisdom, the discernment in situations, because situations tend to repeat themselves. And 
when they repeat themselves, if you keep making the same mistakes, you're not remembering really well what's happened before. But it helps us to gain wisdom because wisdom is more the experiential side of learning, knowing what to do with the knowledge that you've gained. But memories also help to shape who we are. They shape our identity because we're all products of where we've been. All of us have experiences that have shaped who you are today. And that's what Paul is trying to do. He's saying, hey, remember where you've been. Remember where you've come from. And he goes, remember that you were uncircumcised, by the, called uncircumcised by the circumcision. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ without God and without hope. One of the most beautiful conjunctions in the Bible. But now in Christ, Jesus, you were once far off and now been brought near. He's saying, remember that time that Jesus got a hold of you and brought you to him. Remember it. For all the reasons that we just gave. And he's saying, remember it and then remember what happened because of it. He's saying, remember the reconciliation that happened. So reconciliation is one of the, the beautiful things that the gospel does. Reconciliation is a repair in a broken relationship. It's a relationship that's been brought back together and mended. See, we're all sinners. We're all separated from God because of that sin. There's a barrier, a great distance, a wall, or even a veil separating us from God when we're sinful. And Jesus came and tore the veil, mending the relationship. Paul saying, remember. Remember the reconciliation that has happened. But the other amazing thing about the, our reconciliation of the relationship between us and Jesus, our vertical relationship, is that the horizontal relationship becomes mended too. See, the relationship between Jews and Gentiles was, to put bluntly, awful. Jews viewed Gentiles as dogs, not worthy of crumbs off their table, I mean, absolutely hateful language went back between the other. It even was to the point that on the temple mount, where the temple sat, that there was courts for the Gentiles, for the women, for the court of Israel, and the court of priests before getting to the Holy of Holies. And on the temple mount, at the end of the court of the Gentiles, before it got to the temple proper, there was a wall. And they had found plaques that was on this wall that said that if you're a Gentile and you cross this line, you're taking your life into your own hands. Even to the point where they didn't even want to worship with Gentiles that had converted to Judaism. It's like, you cannot pass this line. Our history has been that way. We do not want to worship, have not in the past want to worship with people from different backgrounds, race, color, things of that nature. But because the relationship between us and God has been repaired, our relations can be repaired. I was thinking about this, and since I recently married and recently went through uh, married, premarital counseling, there's this idea of the triangle in a relationship. And you have God, wife, husband. And that the closer you get to God, the closer you get to each other. And that's the same thing with groups of people and parties is that the closer we get to God, the closer we get together and in unity. And that's what Paul, throughout his ministry, was trying to do, was unify the Jewish church and the Gentile church. He's trying to bring them together and say, you are brothers in Christ. That old hatred, that old strife is not there anymore because of the reconciliation that happened with Jesus. You remember that. There can be unity now. And Paul is, is trying to get this across to him, and he spends a lot of time talking to the Gentile churches and even gets them to send money back to Jerusalem that you can find in Romans and 1 Corinthians. But he's trying to bring the people together, and he's like, remember, remember, trying to get them to move forward. But I think there's a couple of things that we can take away from this in our context, in today's time. Remembering causes action. 
He's saying, remember that you were once without God, without hope. When I think of that, I'm like, there's other people that are without hope and without God. I don't want them to be in darkness either. I don't want them to be without hope. So because of me remembering that, I need to go and share hope, share light, and share Jesus with them. I think that's what Paul would like for us to do, is to remember that and to share. Because we're, we're living in a world that doesn't like God very much, that doesn't like Jesus. I found an interesting statistic about students today, because I'm a student minister, and I read a lot about ministering to students. That today, one in three students on average are skeptical. They're skeptical of anything and everything that they hear whether it's someone they've known for a long time or someone they've just met, whether it's in a history book or a story from outside. They're skeptical. We need to share the love of Jesus with them and with people of any background. And as closing today, if you've never experienced the love of Christ, if you've never had the memory of Christ coming into your life and shedding light into your life, as the musicians come and play, this is your opportunity. This is your inv- invitation to come accept Jesus. Also, remember, think of people in your community. Think of people at school, students that you're going to see next fall that don't know Jesus that don't know the gospel, that don't know what salvation is, share with them. Have a conversation. Don't be afraid. Be bold. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for this wonderful day that you've blessed us with. Thank you for the opportunity to get to come and share your word, share your love, Father. Father, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be able to take moments and remember what you've done in our lives. To remember the things that you've accomplished on the cross. And then to go forward with that memory burned in our mind, Father. Father, I pray today that we all know you. That we all leave here encouraged and emboldened to share you with others, Father. Thank you, in Jesus' name.